call this meeting to order and we'll start with the roll call, please. Carr. Cruz. Here. Fox. Here. Frost. Here. Gaylord. Here. Gera. Hansen. Harris. Here. Kennedy. Here. Lee. Here. Natoli. Peters. Cerna. Terry. Okay. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. So with that, we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, which today we'll have led by uh, Director Gaylord. Sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First one I saw was I turned. All right. So with that, we'll move on to uh, announcements. The board, would you read the television announcement, please? This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable system. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated on Saturday, September 29th at 2 p.m. and Monday, October 1st at 4 p.m. on Channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should fill out a speaker form located on the table at the back of the chambers and give it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Also at this time, please silence your cell phones until the conclusion of today's meeting. Thank you, and with that, uh, we'll move on to the Air Pollution Control Officer's Report. Very good. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, thank you for joining us. Good to see you um, here. Uh, we have a, a full agenda for you today, a couple of uh, important discussion items, uh, and as usual, uh, I'm going to run through a number of items uh, that I think are relevant uh, to us, and, and in particular to you as, as our board. Um, so let me, let me go ahead and, and go through that. Uh, the first one uh, is, again, informational. The Coalition for Clean Air is long-standing, uh, very respective uh, statewide NGO, is um, running a campaign that they dubbed the California Cleaner Day uh, coming up next month. And they have made us and other districts aware of this campaign, and, and it's simply to raise awareness. Um, obviously, we're making good progress throughout the state in terms of combating air pollution, but at the same time, we're all fully aware and reminded every summer of, of the challenges of, of still uh, excess uh, air pollution. So what they're doing is uh, they're running this campaign, and uh, they've invited us to join them. Um, it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward. They want us to promote the concept today. Uh, we are going to internally uh, try to come up with some good ideas to engage our staff. Um, you may hear about it in the news, uh, your constituents. So I wanted to make you aware of, of that. That is happening uh, next, uh, next week. I think from my perspective, anything that raises awareness and kind of puts this in front of people, say why we need a, a clean air, it's, it's important. But uh, the Coalition for Clean Air gets, gets the credit for this. I'm just passing it along to you. Um, Along the same lines of sharing with you uh, actions by our sister agencies in the region that are relevant and important to our equality, I wanted to highlight for you what uh, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District is, is doing. Uh, I don't know to what extent you're following this uh, closely. Uh, I am. I'm typically out at the board meetings uh, engaging with them. Um, SMOD has taken a leadership role in, in in California and the nation for that matter, and they've actually um, embraced the idea of doing more than what the state is requiring for utilities to do and doing it sooner. And what that means is that the smart board is actually uh, deliberating a net zero carbon commitment for 2040. It's remarkable because, again, uh, the long-term goal for climate is 2050. Obviously, just a couple weeks ago, the governor issued new legislation, new laws that are going to put the state on a path towards carbon neutrality in 20, 
45. So this is still very relevant because they, they're accelerating uh, what the state is, is doing. And uh, from what I've seen at the board discussion, it, it's likely going to happen. The smart board is likely going to commit to a net zero carbon goal uh, by 2040. Why is that important? Obviously because we're talking about a huge utility, the sixth largest municipal utility in the country. Uh, and, and clearly, as you have heard from us, and we focus on electrifying transportation as the biggest source of our, of our emissions, we want to make sure that the electrons that go into the cars of the future are green electrons. Uh, so this step is very consistent uh, with uh, what we want to accomplish. The other thing um, on the other side as well is obviously electric generating utilities are big sources of emissions. SMOD is in the top uh, 10 of, of our big sources of emissions. So anything that they do to reduce not only their carbon footprint, but to reduce emissions in general is something that we welcome. Uh, I wanted to share that with you. Um, again, they're, they're following the procedure for the integrated resource plan that they have to submit to the Energy Commission in, in April. Uh, but like I said, I, uh, it, it does look, from what I've seen at the board discussion, that this is likely going to uh, move ahead, which, which is great news for all of us. Um, speaking of collaborations, at the moment, as we speak, we have uh, a delegation in Germany uh, led by the Greater Sacramento uh, Economic Council. Uh, the reason I bring that to you is because uh, one of the reasons that we're missing Director Guerra and Director Cerna, as well as one of our senior managers, is they are uh, in the delegation along with GSAC and others. Uh, and the reason they went to Germany is because Sacramento region in general is becoming a focal point for mobility innovation and zero emission technology. And the business side of, of our region is, is trying to attract, uh, obviously, investment for technology manufacturing. Where we come in is clearly, we as, a, as an air district, as a regulatory agency, we can put in place policies that actually support and guide that development uh, to the region. So um, just wanted to put that before you. Uh, hopefully, uh, next, next uh, meeting in October, when, when our directors are back and our staff, we'll give you a little bit more in terms of how the meeting, meeting went. You might have heard about this uh, on the radio. Um, I, I did. The next uh, item I have for you, another uh, very important uh, event that happened here in, in, in California and in San Francisco not long ago. Um, it was the Global Climate Action Summit, which really highlighted the role of cities and localities to fill the gap in terms of the climate agenda that we currently suffer from, not only at the federal level, but uh, internationally. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. I was actually out on vacation that week, but uh, we had our staff uh, did attend. We covered several events, uh, and I'm going to have uh, Mark Lutzenhauser give us a brief uh, update. Good morning, board. Mark Lutzenhauser, Division Manager for Program Coordination. Uh, as Alberto already mentioned, there were a number of different activities going on. We actually were able to attend four different events over the course of the week, some of us running back and forth between events, same day even. Um, so just touching upon some of those very quickly, one of them was the Diesel Free by 33 event being hosted by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, which is a very aggressive uh, strategy to go ahead and reduce uh, diesel emissions in their area. Uh, it was very well attended. It was a great discussion. We actually had Mayor Steinberg from Sacramento who also signed on to the pledge just supporting them, was there and was actually one of the speakers in the afternoon. Definitely did a great job highlighting a lot of the efforts that Sacramento as a whole, both the county and the city have been working on, in terms of our transportation, our corridors, and just all the great work we've been doing. In addition to that, UC Davis was hosting a summit related to greenhouse gas emissions. Again, surprisingly, a big focus was transportation. Uh, there was a lot of great speakers, um, international speakers, local speakers, and other national speakers from elsewhere in the country, talking a lot about where they're going with their public transportation, what they're looking to do with their fleets, where they're looking to go with the sources of cleaning up those emissions even. So as Alberto had just mentioned a moment ago, when we were talking about SMUD and the great efforts our local utility is doing, it was also part of the focus there on that discussion. Two other quick ones that were going on was CalStart was hosting an air, uh, a workshop as well. 
focused a lot on some of the programs they're doing in the state of California, a lot of incentive programs, and so they were definitely doing, theirs was a drive to zero workshop, very effective. Uh, the staff that were at that one said there was some great feedback. They were also part of the presentations themselves. And the final one that we were able to attend was the Air Sensors International Conference, which was a big part of what was going on. It was a multi-day conference. I will sum it up in just a couple of short words here in the sense that the big focus was, as you'd imagine, on monitoring. And so they were looking at a lot of the low-cost sensors, which is a great tie-in with our local 617 efforts and how we're going to be going into the communities. And that's actually being heard by the California Air Resources Board as we speak on that selection of a community. But also then the importance of how those sensors do compare to the regulatory monitors themselves, and that they are not a replacement for the regulatory monitors, and a lot about how we message that information to the public. So as they do look at data that comes in from these low-cost sensors, and they see some numbers that may otherwise seem high, that they don't become alarmed unnecessarily. Um, they're good sensors. They're good in the sense of providing that information of the ups and downs of what's going on. The relative nature in the morning, if it's lower, afternoon it picks up, that is true. Is it reading, for example, an 80 when the actual regular monitors are reading 20? No, we gotta trust the regulatory monitor. But the ups and downs and just that helping to give them that information, though, is very effective. And the messaging will be a key piece as we move forward, both with this technology as a whole, but also as a good reminder as we move forward with our AB 617 community monitoring. And that's a quick wrap up on the Global Climate Summit. Thank you, Mark. Um, as, as Mark mentioned, uh, one of the key um, policies that was rolled out, a key pledge, was this uh, effort by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, uh, diesel free by 33. Um, it is relevant for us because obviously uh, diesel combustion is a, a big source of emissions for us. Um, diesel emissions are also known carcinogens. Uh, that's not to say that other combustion is good for you. Diesel emission is the one that has been studied the most and is recognized. Um, and what I want to leave you with is um, Mayor Steinberg, on behalf of the city of Sacramento, did make, make the pledge. She was there. Um, obviously, we were in, in conversation with the city, talking to, to his staff. Um, it's a pledge. So now comes the tough part of trying to figure out exactly what it means for our region. But again, this is very consistent with uh, the agenda for clean air that this agency has embraced for many years. The fact that we're going to continue to push to clean technology, we're going to continue to push for getting access to state investments so that we can buy our way into uh, lower emitting uh, sources uh, all the way down to zero uh, as soon as we, as soon as we, we can. So stay tuned. We'll bring you updates as, as they develop. Uh, and the last thing I want to share with you, and I was hoping that we would have at least uh, Director Hansen here, but unfortunately he's, he's not uh, feeling too, too good this morning, uh, and we're missing uh, Director Guerra. The reason I wanted them here is because they were actually part of the press event that Mayor Steinberg and Mayor Cabalan held uh, a couple of weeks ago to roll out this new idea of the Mayor's Commission on Climate Change. I had mentioned this before to you in one of my reports. Uh, it is out there. Uh, we began to convene the large group of actors that are going to contribute to it. Uh, we have yet to define precisely the scope and, and, the, and the depth of, of what this is going to do. But again, from our perspective, this becomes another very important tool. It will give us a platform to run ideas uh, through other folks, uh, to collaborate, to, to sort of uh, uh, get unified behind a common goal and an agenda that can help us amplify and leverage uh, the things that we can do as an air district. So again, just wanted to share that uh, with you. Also stay tuned as, as we develop more, um, more concepts and, and, and a precise idea in terms of what we're going to do with this. We'll bring it back to you. So that is my report for this board uh, hearing. If, if you have any questions or comments, um, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. So with that, we'll move on to our consent calendar. Consent calendar items are things that are normally deemed routine and non-controversial. Um, is there anything that anybody has questions on or needs to pull from the calendar? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move consent. I'm sorry, okay, uh, motion by Cruz, do I have a second? Second by Gaylord, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. 
Okay, so we'll move on to our discussion calendar and our first item is item five, uh, district authority over cannabis operations final staff assessment. Now here's something that I bet Director Garrow would have wanted to hear. <laughs> Considering I'm pretty sure all of it's being grown in his district, or will be. Go Good morning, board. Um, Chair Terry and the rest of the board. Uh, my name is Brian Krebs. I'm a, a program supervisor in the stationary source division in the permitting section. And today I'd like to give you a brief uh, uh, presentation on our final assessment on uh, permitting and enforcement authority over cannabis operations. Just as a little background, uh, we met uh, and I gave a presentation back in January or earlier this year where we gave some potential impacts due to this new emerging cannabis uh, industry. And at that time, we gave some preliminary assessment as to uh, what kinds of uh, regulatory authority we may have over the operations. Um, since that time, we've formulated and, and you know, finalized our authority, and that's what I'll be uh, giving you some information on. Uh, but that, that uh, authority uh, was, has this gone off? Okay. Uh, the authority has been, um, oh, I'm just confused, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Uh, what I was going to say was that in developing the final authority, we went through a long, arduous process where we uh, met with many uh, districts throughout California and various committees to find out you know, what, what their thought, what thoughts were, were on that. Uh, we met with uh, our own legal counsel to discuss uh, different issues. And from that, we kind of finalized our authority. We came up with a matrix of uh, permitting uh, actions. And we subsequently had discussions with some members of the board, as well as uh, city staff, to discuss where we were going with that, as well as to solicit comments and to work on inter entity coordination. Now, for the authority, the meat and potatoes of this is that um, we have to split it into two different groups, and that is cultivation and the manufacturing. And this slide here uh, represents the cultivation. And in general, cultivation, in our opinion, in our authority, is that it is a agricultural operation. And as such, it is exempt from district permitting authority uh, per our own Rule 201, Section 114. In addition, odors emanating from, uh, from agricultural operations are exempt from public nuisance. And that uh, authority stems from California Health and Safety Code. Um, now, as far as power generation, and that was one of the uh, main issues that we were concerned about with this new industry, is that uh, power generation used exclusive, exclusively for cultivation. And let me just break up a little bit the fact that uh, when we talk about prime power, we're talking about generators, electric generators, that operate continuously as their prime uh, utility power. Uh, emergency standby engines are just that. They're used in the event that uh, power is lost from the local utility. So with that said, uh, stationary prime power, since we have no permitting authority, it falls under the state's distributed generation requirements. Uh, and, and that's a health and safety code section. And then in addition, and that would apply to any, whether it's natural gas or diesel, but in addition, if a diesel engine were to be proposed for prime power, it would also have to fall under the state uh, air toxic control measure and obtain agricultural engine registration. Then when we talk about emergency standby equipment, if it's greater than 50 horsepower, it still would also have to get that uh, agriculture engine registration, but all other fuels would be exempt. So that's our only permitting requirements, and they're not really permitting requirements, they are just requirements that would be put on the cultivation. Now, as far as manufacturing goes, we're talking about things that generate particulate matter, such as sifting, squeezing, screening, or items that uh, generate uh, volatile organic compounds, and it's kind of ironic that it's called non-volatile solid extraction, but one, one uh, determination of that is that uh, ethanol is considered by, by definition of this definition to be non-volatile, but as far as the air district's concerned, it is volatile, so we would be concerned with that. And then as far as permitting requirements go, it really 
because manufacturing is not considered agricultural, it falls under our normal permitting requirements and exemptions. And that essentially is the two pounds per day. Uh, if it's greater than two pounds per day, then it would require a permit for either the particulate matter emissions, if there are such, or greater than two pounds per day for VOCs from ethanol in the so-called non-volatile solid extraction process. And then as far as uh, odor goes, uh, in general, if a facility is not required to get a permit for any of the other two requirements that we just mentioned, then we could still require a permit if it's been determined that it's necessary in order to abate a, uh, a public nuisance. So in other words, if, uh, if we receive odor complaints or other health concerns from VOC emissions that are less than, than the permit criteria up above, we would require a permit for the odor control and abatement of that. And then, uh, then on the, on the uh, power generation side for manufacturing, uh, we do have permitting authority, but again, it falls under our normal permitting authority, and that is that uh, power generation, natural gas or diesel, stationary or portable, it, a permit would be required if the engine is greater than 50 horsepower, and it would also be required, even if it's less than 50 horsepower, if it's determined that it's part of a process that ordinarily would require a permit. And then lastly, or conversely, permit would be exempt if it's less than 50 horsepower and not part of a process. And then as far as combined operations go, that's operations that have both cultivation and manufacturing. Uh, the manufacturing part of it would require permitting in accordance with the uh, requirements for manufacturing and it would only be exempt if the applicant could prove to us that it is solely used in the cultivation side of it. But if it has any operational uh, characteristics that apply to the manufacturing side, then it would require a permit. One of the questions that was uh, asked of us was about uh, illegal cannabis operations. And so we had to look at what we could potentially do as far as our authority goes. And if we're talking about manufacturing or combined operation, uh, a permit would be required, uh, or if yes, meaning that if a permit uh, or if the emissions were such that they were above our permitting thresholds, then the potential violation of District Rule 201 would be the failure to get, obtain a permit. Again, this is for illegal manufacturing operations. And then on Rule 402, nuisance, since we do have nuisance authority, it would be potential, assuming that you know, they did cause a public nuisance. As far as illegal cultivation... Uh, Actually, we have a quick question from oh, uh, yes. Director Natoli. Yeah, j just as you're talking about illegal cultivation and or um, uh, operation, you say without city permits in the other jurisdictions, maybe with the exception of Alton, uh, is considering some changes. The unincorporated area, and I believe other cities, have prohibited uh, both grows and manufacture, and so that would apply even though we don't have, there's not a structure in place for permitting legal operations, illegal is illegal, and so therefore those would apply in those other jurisdictions as well? Well, I, I guess what we're saying is that from a, from a city standpoint, you know, it's illegal because they didn't get the proper uh, authorizations, but from an air district standpoint, yeah. it comes down to whether or not the emissions are above. Uh, but, but you missed my point. My, my okay. point is, is if, they didn't, if they're not even permitted and they're operating, they could still be in violation just because there's a structure to permit legal versus illegal operations in the city of Sacramento. In the unincorporated area of the county of Sacramento, I'll let other cities speak for themselves. If it's not permitted at all, and they were to utilize equipment that was in violation of air standards, and they would just be in just as much a violation without permits there as well, right? That's correct. Okay, so I want to be clear because it says without city permits, and, and that would be multiple cities and or counties because there's not a, a regulatory structure for permitting them at all uh, in most of those other jurisdictions. And I, I just want to be clear about that because it's not just, a, you, you, the question has been asked in the city of Sacramento, but this would apply in the county, so you could have similar violations in the unincorporated area, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, those and, rules would apply. And just to emphasize the, yeah. the point, Director Anatoly, you're absolutely correct, uh, and we will uh, make uh, an adjustment to make sure that we clarify that point. Okay. But illegal is illegal anywhere uh, in the county. 
Um, and to the extent that we are able to have access and find it, then what we're talking about in terms of our authority would apply. Or, or you got brought to you by a code officer or some other or, or a right. um, law enforcement operation, then you, know, you were looking at multiple tracks for uh, approaching the illegality, then the Air District could be brought into it. I'm not saying you'd necessarily be doing the enforcement initially, but you might be brought into the overall structure of a case that was made against a particular operation. That is, that is correct, and that, is, that has been a point that we've made uh, uh, very clear, because obviously we're not first responders. Right. Uh, we're not going to be the ones going in first. But to the extent that there is a process, and this has been part of the conversation with the City of Sacramento, to the extent that there is a process by which we can then determine that the limit of two pounds per day has been exceeded, then this would apply. So we will make that, that okay. adjustment. The okay. point is well taken. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. As far as uh, engines, you know, power generation goes, again, if we're talking about just cultivation, they would be exempt from a permit, but other potential violations that we could potentially process would be uh, the distributed generation requirements or the diesel uh, ATCM, the stationary diesel ATCM. That would be if those uh, equipment fell in, into either one of those categories. And then as far as illegal cultivation operation, uh, since again there is no district permit requirement there's, and we don't have permit or uh, uh, nuisance authority over it, essentially we have no regulatory authority to, to write a violation under those circumstances. And then as far as potential uh, fines that could be assessed, uh, depends. typically we're talking about failure to obtain a permit and you're looking somewhere in the ballpark of $1,000 to $25,000 and it's a range. Another uh, issue that we want to talk about are other potential impacts and that would be from uh, VOC or greenhouse gases from um, the uh, from cannabis waste, the disposal of cannabis waste. Uh, we did a back of the envelope calculation and determined that we're talking probably around 40 acres of cannabis uh, grown per year. Um, and currently the majority of this cannabis waste is, is disposed of at the county land, landfill. Um, you may be aware of SB 1383, which is the short-lived climate pollutant uh, regulation that uh, pertains to organic waste uh, from uh, methane or organic waste methane emissions. It's essentially organic waste diversion. And we had to try to figure out whether this additional um, acreage uh, was factored in on that at all. And conversations with Cal Recycle believes that the cannabis waste uh, will re uh, represent a very small portion of the overall green waste. So they didn't specifically account for it in their uh, process. However, it's a very small amount in the overall scheme of things. So they don't foresee that as causing much of a problem. And then as lastly, as far as next steps, uh, we are currently uh, working uh, on developing or we have developed a, a web page uh, that will have uh, information on there such as the permit applicability uh, permit applicability matrix that someone can look to see whether or not they need a permit, permit application forms, and contact person. Uh, we are going to develop an advisory that will be sent out to each of the uh, cannabis operators that have conditional use permits, uh, re deferring or referring them to our website and getting the proper information. And then lastly, we've committed to um, going to the City of Sacramento stakeholder meeting to, um, to uh, engage with the uh, cannabis industry to answer any questions they have regarding permit applicability and getting them to, uh, you know, answering their questions and, and directing them to the appropriate places to get their permits. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Any questions for staff? Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, Director Harris. So uh, you may know that uh, the city of Sacramento is actively trying to permit and, and bring uh, these operations into the light, if you will. I would say there's a general amount of ignorance about, you know, the, the air aspect of cultivation. Uh, so there's a lot of education to do with, with these um, new permittees, if you will, certainly in the city. Uh, do you have a plan at this point about, you know, other than going to stakeholder meetings, do you have any other way to purvey the information about them complying with air district rules? 
currently we were uh, going to uh, utilize the advisory that we'll send to each one of them at, you know with information on where they can get the, the permit applications, the applicability requirements, and with contact information for, for that. Other than that, uh, I'm not, I'll defer to. So one, one thing I, I will acknowledge, um, we agreed um, when we were working with the City of Sacramento staff to continue uh, the dialogue and stay connected. Uh, and they uh, were hoping that they will provide a platform when they have their own meetings uh, uh, before council and otherwise, uh, to try to uh, to help us get the information out. But uh, if if the board has any suggestions, um, you know we've uh, this was a tough question that the board posed for us, and you know it took us a better part of a year. Uh, but I'm very confident that we landed at a very good place and a clear place in terms of the air district role. Um, we want to continue to work with the city of Sacramento simply because again this is an issue for for the city and the staff, but if you have any suggestions in terms of how to better get the information out. Uh, Alberto, I, I think my more specific question is, is the City of Sacramento sharing with you the permittee contact information? Not at this moment, because for one thing, I want to say we didn't specifically ask. Now, we are just beginning our process. Uh, we need to get our information out. We need to frame our permitting and where it applies and the forms and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would anticipate based on the constructive dialogue we had, to the extent that we need that, I feel conf confident that we can go out and, and seek that information. Uh, likewise, I think we left the door open to the extent that they need us at the table. Uh, we are, we're ready and more than willing to engage with them. But this is still work in progress. Understood. Um, you know, I, I will uh, make a point to, to talk to the city attorney's office and see if there's any roadblock to them sharing that information with you. We'll see if we can facilitate that to some extent. Thank you. Any other questions for staff on this? Thank you. Thank you. So that will move on to item six, greenhouse gas emissions inventories and the aviation, in the aviation sector. Chair Terry, members of the board, I'm Paul Philly. I'm a program supervisor with the Transportation and Climate Change Division here at the Air District. And there's been a lot of exciting changes in, that are upcoming in the aviation sector. And uh, we thought this would be a good time to talk about it a little bit and what it might mean for the region. So when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, the transportation sector is the largest in California at 41% and aviation represents about two and a half percent of that or one percent of the total slice. Um, a couple things to remember is that this inventory only counts flights that begin and end in the state of California. If you think globally, uh, it's about three percent of the global emissions when you factor in things like international and interstate flights, and it is a growing sector. The other thing is we're only talking about emissions from the airplanes themselves. So for example, uh, Sacramento International is currently converting its shuttles from the parking lot to zero emission Proterra buses. Uh, that would not be counted. So to be clear, it's just in this inventory, we're only talking about the direct uh, emissions, which typically come from either jet fuel uh, or from aviation gasoline or avgas. When it comes to jet fuel, um, we don't have a lot of information or control because it's exempt. We don't permit it, it's done at the airport, um, it's federally regulated, and there's not a lot of zero emission options today when it comes to replacing this fuel one for one. However, for avgas or aviation gasoline, it is permitted by the Air District and it's currently dispensed in six different facilities throughout the county. Um, the amount of throughput that happens is about 322,000 gallons a year, and to give you a sense of scale, if you compared it to all the other gasoline sold in the county, uh, or the district, I should say, it's about less than one-tenth of one percent, uh, or what a Costco would sell in 10 days, or about what 3,000 cars would use over the year. One thing that is a little bit special about Avgas is that it is the only transportation fuel that's leaded left in this country, and so reduction of that inventory also has other localized health benefits we should consider. When it comes to reducing aviation emissions, uh, the state of California has really gone all in on mode shift. So if you look at the greenhouse gas reduction fund, a lot is going into high-speed rail, TIRCP, or the Transit Intercity Rail Program. And so they want to start reducing those Northern California, Southern California trips. 
the other thing that also might be possible in the future is electrified automated vehicles. So if someone has a meeting at eight o'clock in the morning in Portland, it's not outside the possibility you could hire a van conversion and then sleep and then wake up in Portland for your meeting. Um, we're also seeing a lot of desire in the industry to go to increased fuel economy. So one of the big selling points of the new Boeing Dreamliner is that it uses less fuel than a typical airplane. So there's a lot of investment going on in that area. And we're also seeing actual zero emission planes taking off uh, in this sector as well. So the first electric plane flew in 1917, but we actually have a modern uh, Pipistrelle Alpha Electro being tested right now in Fresno under an experimental FAA license. Uh, Central Valley is a great place to learn to fly, uh, generally good weather, generally flat, um, but currently the FAA doesn't have a really good regulatory scheme for electric aviation, so that's something that needs to happen so that this uh, sector can start to grow. Um, when we're talking about how quickly uh, the innovation is happening, uh, right now we've got big players like Boeing and small startups, Wells Fargo's investing into this space. And to give you a sense of scale about how quickly this could happen, ARB seriously started talking about electric and zero emission vehicles uh, for cars in 1990, and today in 2018, they're generally available. Whether you want a compact, an SUV, a box truck, you can get something zero emission. The country in Norway uh, recently passed a regulation that all of their short haul flights in 2040 is going to have to be zero emission. So while it took electric cars 28 years to ramp up, we see electric aviation taking off in 22 years. When we're bringing it back home to the Sacramento region, um, as we wear other hats and do other things, uh, a couple things we may wish to keep in mind. When we're doing things like electrifying ground equipment, uh, it's n basically getting electricity or hydrogen to a location is the expensive thing. It doesn't take too much more to upsize and add an additional plug. So we may want to think about multimodal opportunities when we're making these investments for charging of planes. Uh, we also have directors missing because they're trying to bring innovation to the region in our technology corridor. And so Central Valley is, and especially the Sacramento region, is a great place to be thinking about, do we want to try to support this industry and bring that investment to this region? There's also, we're farm to fork capital. Um, we have a lot of planes going around over the rice fields and other crops, uh, which has a duty profile that fits very much with the short range, short hop, and cheap fuel because it only cost about two bucks to fill up that uh, pipistrelle. So that could be a, a potential synergy we could have. And finally, economic inclusion is something that we may wish to consider. Uh, for example, the Young Eagle program here locally and, well, nationally, uh, takes kids up in airplanes to get them excited about the aviation sector as a potential uh, way to join the economy. And uh, flight school is very expensive and a big part of that is the fuel. So if we can bring down the cost of learning to fly and getting involved in aviation, we can see more potential opportunities for that. So to conclude, there's been a lot of very exciting innovations happening. Um, there is a way for this region to be involved if we choose to be so. And I'd like to introduce uh, Joseph Oldham from CalStart to talk a little bit about the sustainable aviation project that's been happening in Fresno. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here today. I wish I had flown instead of driving three hours from Fresno. Um, but actually the drive brought home what I like to refer to as the tyranny of ground transportation and our challenges here in, particularly in California, with congestion and the growing uh, numbers of vehicles that are on our roads as we try to travel around the state. One of the exciting things that electric aviation does is it lowers the cost of aircraft operations to a point where it starts to become practical to consider short haul flights like between Fresno and Sacramento in very economical aircraft with uh, cost per seat mile that are ra rivaling uh, the automobile. One of the exciting things that I've been able to do with the Sustainable Aviation Project, and I'm, I'm the one that's flying the aircraft, so if you want to know what it's like to fly an electric airplane, I can tell you. I have about almost 90 hours of flying in these aircraft now since we received them in March. And they are amazing. And they do some amazing things that you can't do with a piston or a turbine aircraft. 
um, and their efficiency is quite phenomenal. I drive a Chevy Volt and I have had this car for over five years and my typical electric fuel economy is about four miles per kilowatt hour. The Alpha Electro will actually beat that and it beats it by quite a bit. Uh, I get typically with the Alpha Electro about 4.3 miles per kilowatt hour and that's cruising at 73 miles per hour. If I was trying to do that in my bolt in my bolt, I couldn't get that kind of fuel economy. So there the efficiency of these aircraft is quite amazing and um, it'll be transformative. One of the exciting things is that electric propulsion allows us to look at designs of aircraft um, well uh, Paul didn't really show you some of the exciting eVTOL, which electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft designs that are out there. We've actually been working with the companies that are building these aircraft. Uh, some of them, such as Kitty Hawk, have actually sent their test pilots down to fly with us in the Alpha Electros. We've also had visits from Boeing and Boeing Horizon X, who've been down and evaluated our, uh, the air, uh, aircraft and flown in them. And uh, what we're seeing is this growing interest in taking this technology and, and really expanding it and democratizing it, where these aircraft can then operate at a level that the average person can afford to either fly in them, which is Uber's plan with their Uber air service uh, to provide a very low cost uh, air taxi kinds of service in congested environments. Uh, like the Bay Area or Los Angeles, um, and also to provide effective short-haul flights, like say between Sacramento and uh, say Reed Hillview in, uh, in, in San Jose. It opens up the opportunity to use underutilized airports all across Cal California and all across the United States. And that's why NASA and a lot of uh, the folks at the FAA are really excited about this, and we are working very closely with the FAA. So, you know, Paul did a great job of um, explaining everything that's going on in this sector. So with that, I'll just kind of close it off. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Okay. I love how we're following this right after the, the big air show in my city. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Presented with the, the county, of course. Um, any questions for? <clears throat> yeah. I, so, my understanding is there's, it, the cost is less you said yes. miles per kilowatt hour what is the cost per kilowatt hour well or is that a comparable how do you compare well it? the cost per kilowatt hour is well, i mean it's what you pay with the typical commercial electric rate we're paying about 20 cents a kilowatt hour for our power uh, from pg e down in that's Fresno. quite a bit less yes it is what uh, is that rate in the smud area yeah, it's probably Eight. lower than that in smud. Peak hours uh, so yeah. the aircraft typically takes about 15 kilowatt hours to do a typical flight. So we're paying 20 cents. So it's about three bucks uh, for each flight. And I can fly for about an hour on a charge and still have a healthy reserve. The aircraft has about a 60 nautical mile range uh, at its most economical cruise speed and about 50 nautical miles if I want, really want to kind of kick it up there and fly about 100 miles an hour instead of about 75. And, and I wanted, to, I've probably seen too many movies, but I have to ask this. Sure. Uh, I'm, I don't know how electricity responds to weather or is there an event, I'm thinking of public safety mm -hmm. in, the for, in, in the way of passenger planes, whereby if it's an electric plane, is there a weather event that could disable the that um, no you know like in a nuclear event all the phones are going to go off and the cars mm -hmm. are going to stop in the middle of the road um, yeah is there any anything like that no um, the aircraft are actually more resilient to uh, weather um, than piston or turbine engines uh, to be quite frank um, we don't I don't have to worry about uh, carburetor icing that which is a condition that occurs with a piston engine aircraft if you've got high uh, ambient uh, humidity and uh, or during rain or you know cold kinds of climate uh, conditions. I don't have to worry about that because it's not carbureted. 
I don't have to worry about air intake because there is no air intake. The motor is just as uh, efficient and just as powerful at 10,000 feet as it is at uh, 200 feet. So the, there's a lot of advantages with electric propulsion. Plus, the designs are very, very compact. The motor in the Alpha Electro, um, well, a typical piston engine aircraft uh, trainer would have a motor that would take up about the size of this podium's uh, top here. The Alpha Electro motor is literally about this big around and about that thick. Mm -hmm. And it weighs about 11 pounds and it's equal to an 80 horsepower uh, gasoline piston engine. So that compact design characteristic allows electric propulsion aircraft to be designed in ways to make them extremely efficient. And so, um, you know, it's, and plus they're extremely reliable. There's only one moving part and it's the shaft. And there is only one area that can fail on that shaft and that's the bearings. And the motor is designed to not be touched for 2,000 hours. At 2,000 hours on a piston engine aircraft, you have to overhaul the engine, replace the bearings, the, the pistons, um, you know, even the cylinders. And that's a huge cost. With these aircraft, you just look at the bearings. If they're OK, you put it back in for another 2,000. You do that three times until you hit 6,000 hours. And then you replace the motor. So there's huge savings in terms of uh, the cost of operation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, Director Natoli. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for making the trip up here this morning. Um, just a, a couple questions. So with the, you talked about the vertical takeoff yes. and, and thinking about getting into some of the more